Now we're going to look at uh, disturbances to equilibrium with temperature. So like if we really increase temperature or decrease temperature after our system is already at equilibrium. Now, we've already seen that the rate of a reaction is dependent on temperature. We were able to look at the rate constant and using the Arrhenius equation, see how that rate constant changes as you increase and decrease temperature. So we know that the rate of a reaction will increase with an increase in temperature. So that's occurring. But when we're at equilibrium, we have two reactions taking place, right? So we've got a forward and a reverse reaction. And those forward and reverse rates, um, as temperature increases or decreases, would be affected differently. Um, now, here's the interesting thing. This is going to be different if you have an exothermic reaction or an endothermic reaction. So let's look at exothermic first. Uh, here's an example reaction. It's one of the ones we've been using, combining hydrogen and nitrogen to form ammonium. Now this reaction has a negative enthalpy and that makes it exothermic, yay. So an exothermic reaction releases energy into its surroundings. Uh, so another way to think about this is that energy is a product, right? If you take your reactants at its higher energy and form the more stable products, you have excess energy that's left over, that's released. And so if you form those products, you're left over with extra energy. And so what, the way I find this easiest to follow is to think of that energy as a product, that heat is a product. And so think about this the way we did um, concentration. If I'm gonna increase one of my products, I know that I'm gonna shift to the left and form more reactants. So if I increase the temperature on this reaction, I'm going to be able to shift this reaction towards the reactants to kind of compensate for all that extra heat that is in the system, right? Um, and if that heat is decreased in the system, I'm gonna produce more of it to reestablish equilibrium. Um, and so I'm gonna to shift to the right. And so, so what we're seeing here is we're going to treat heat as a thing. We're gonna treat heat as a reactant or a product. And if we're at equilibrium, we're not just at equilibrium in terms of the amount of our reactants and our products, but we're also at equilibrium in terms of the heat that was produced. And so by increasing our temperature, we're gonna have more of this product around and we'll shift to the left. And if we decrease our temperature, we'll need to, to, to make up for that loss of one of our products, our heat, and we'll form more products and shift to the right. Now, if things are endothermic, here's a reaction that's N2O4 going to NO2. It has an enthalpy that's plus 57.2, making it endothermic. And so that means to be able to form products that are less stable than our reactants, we have to input in energy in the form of heat to be able to um, form those products at a higher energy. And so I can think of heat as a reactant, like it's a necessary part of the reaction. As it progresses, the reaction will steal heat from the surroundings, pulling it in and, and consuming it essentially and storing it as chemical energy. So now this is gonna be the opposite of what we just saw with an end exothermic reaction. So when it's endothermic, we're gonna think of that heat as a reactant. And when we think of it as a reactant, if we're increasing the amount of heat we have, then we're going to shift our equilibrium away from the reactants towards the products uh, and, and we'll form more products. Now, if we decrease that heat, we've removed some of the energy from the reactant side, we're going to shift our reaction towards the reactants um, and form more of them and form more of that heat that was lost. Just like the same way we saw equilibrium shift with concentrations of reactants and products, we're gonna see it react the same way when there's increases or decreases in temperature. It's just where we think of that heat as being as either a product or a reactant changes if it's exothermic or endothermic. We'll also see that there's a temperature dependence of K. And this is something we'll go into more detail on um, in the next quarter's class as we bring in concepts like free energy and entropy, which we'll need to really, really dive into this. But what we can say is that we know that uh, as temperature increases, K increases when we have an endothermic reaction. And we see the opposite trend that as temperature increases, uh, the equilibrium constant decreases. and 
these trends of the temperature dependence of the magnitude of K, the equilibrium constant, is really coming from a place where the temperature being proportional to kinetic energy um, means that using collision theory, that when we have more kinetic energy around, the average kinetic energy of our particles will increase, which means we're going to have on average more collisions that have enough kinetic energy to overcome our activation energy barrier. Now, this is going to have a larger impact on whichever direction of our reaction has the smaller activation energy. So remember, when we're looking at an endothermic reaction, oops, we have a reaction diagram that looks like this, right? And so if you think about the reverse reaction, it has a smaller activation energy, right? Than our forward direction, which would have one right here. And similarly with our, our exothermic, we have the smaller, oops, smaller activation energy in the forward direction. And so that's gonna have just an impact on that, that K value overall in how our, our two different rates are gonna be different. Um, and we'll kind of save this discussion for a later quarter, but I'd like to kind of set the stage and just draw attention to it. So that way, when I go, hey, remember equilibrium later on, you're like, oh yeah, remember, you know, there's at least a drawer in my brain ready to put some information in later. <laughs>